Hey guys, this is John and welcome to another climbing the rating ladder video. I'm playing HX Hexic, H Hexic, a 2008 rated player in a 10 minute game. Okay, they open with the Nimzar Larson B3 on move one. I'm going to play D5. I think I'll play my usual against this opening, which is this quick Bishop G4. I'm real fond of this setup for black. It hinders the E3 move for white. So also gives you the option of knight F of uh, taking the knight on F3 should it make an appearance there. White plays G3. Haven't really encountered that approach before in this position. Clearly going for the double fianchetto. So I'm thinking if I want to play something like C6, knight D7, work up to E5, I think almost certainly my pawn will end up on C6. So let's go ahead and play it. I could maybe try to keep it flexible and try to play for C5, but I like that more if white commits the pawn to D4. So I'm going to refrain from taking too much space there in favor of solidity, blocking this bishop, letting this bishop have free reign for now, but I'm okay with that. I'm not a huge fan of putting the pawn on E5 too early, unless it's already protected. Yeah, like here I might play E5 because I do have the knight defending. We saw this in another climbing the rating ladder game recently. So yeah, let's play it. If knight F3, I can play bishop D6 and back this pawn up. So no real concern there. Okay, G4, my opponent aggressively pushing on the king side here. Obviously, they want this bishop out of their face. The thing is, though, having induced h3 and g4, I feel pretty good about my uh, prospects on the king side if white ever castles this way. So we'll see what white does with the king. All right, knight d2. So bishop d6 comes to mind here, simply developing the bishop, reinforcing e5. I could play my knight out as well, knight g to f6. Maybe there's some value of of pursuing a setup like a bishop d6 and knight e7, keeping open the option for f5. So I'm thinking about that too. Yeah, I think normally I'd put the knight on f6, but just based on the way white has played this, I might want to retain some flexibility. If I do put the knight on f6, I have to be wary that white may play g5. So let's go ahead and play the bishop d6 move. Maybe white could try something like f4, but I think it's clear at this point white is adopting a hippo setup. They are going for a setup involving most likely this knight coming to e2 to pair with the knight on d2. And I'm already thinking about pawn breaks here, folks. So my experience playing against the hippo setup is you want to try to train your pieces and pawns on a particular point on the board where you feel good about advancing and you feel good about causing problems for your opponent. And for me, that may be the f5 square. Okay, so let's castle here. I may just play pawn f5 if allowed. Hope you're all doing well. I tried to record a game against a mid-1600s rated player just moments ago, but then they hung their queen like on move four. So <laughs> that short-circuited short the game pretty quickly. But fortunately, we're playing a good player here. So not quite decision time for white yet. Players who play this type of setup are usually content to sit back for a while. They do play h4. I think that's a natural move looking to trap my bishop with h5. I can decide on playing h5 or h6. I'm kind of leaning towards h6 in this case because it keeps things a little more compact around my king. If I play h5, there's knight g3. I could also play f5, but then h5, bishop, bishop f7, g5 might come into the picture. So yeah, I think h6 is a good compromise here. And I still have an eye towards playing f5. I'm not married to the plan of f5. If white gets even more aggressive on the king side, maybe I'll pull back on that in favor of something on the queen side. Yeah, like white's angling the knight here. This is a common spot for this knight in this line. Uh, going to the g3 square to control f5. So it's probably playable here. I'm still going to think about it, but I also like the idea of maybe playing something like a5 and starting to explore my options on this wing. I don't see much further concern on the king side. So if I want to put f5 on pause, that's probably fine. So maybe I should play something like a5. Let's just do that and see how white responds to this. Yep, white staying flexible. This is what hippo players do. They have to understand pawn play and pawn breaks pretty well to play this opening. So looks pretty natural. Okay, so a4, b4, c5 comes to mind here. Uh, B5, if I want to gain space. 
Again, the F5 plan. Yeah, B5 might be a nice move if ever White Castle's on the queen side. So that does come to mind here. I think I'm going to go for it. Yeah, let's, let's advance, grab a little more space, make it clear to White like, hey, I have a feeling you're going to castle this way, and I want to have my pawns up here in preparation for an attack when you do, but not yet revealing my hand with this F5 break. Because with F5, we got to assume that there will be one or two captures over here. I can try to gun for the F2 pawn, but if White suddenly whisks their king away in this direction, maybe I'll thank myself for having played uh, B5. But yeah, don't be alarmed if there's a postponement of a clash of the pieces and pawns in an opening like this. That can happen. Okay, uh, knight f3. I wonder if white's trying to go to h4 with this move. Leaves this pawn undefended. I don't see anything major I can do to capitalize on that. Still looking at the f5 move. If I wanted to play it, still not a bad choice. e4, also kind of interesting. If pawn takes e4, bishop takes g3. But I don't know about giving up my strong dark square bishop. I'm not quite sure about that. So I might play another reinforcement move or maybe even c5. I might think about playing c5 here. Get another pawn on the fifth rank. And start thinking about a, a move like uh, c4 or a4. This is defended. I've got both these pawns defended nicely in the center. So... If I play c5, possibly white's going to go for e4. Maybe I should have that on my radar. Yeah, c5, e4, and trying to, to gain an absolute grip on the f5 square. That might be white's plan now that I think about it. So the e4 move by me would cut against that plan. So I am considering it again. Does look interesting. E4 takes, bishop takes g3, and then ultimately take with the bishop. I like the look of that structure overall. I'm just not sure about the dark score weaknesses. Queen d4, I can play f6. Sorry, Ben Feingold. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm kind of coming around to this plan because I'm realizing if I don't do it, white's probably going to play e4, or at least think about that option seriously in the future. And that may jive well with their knight h4 to f5 plan. So if I play e4 myself, Notice how that's two points of contact. I feel like that could work out pretty well. Yeah, let's go ahead and play it. Knight takes e4 does not work for white because I take with the pawn. And not only is there no attack on my bishop, but uh, even if there was, I'd be going up a piece. Okay, so white does take here. We're going to insert the trade on g3 in between move. Eliminate that knight. White takes back with their pawn. Now, I have a choice between pawn takes and bishop takes on e4. Both look interesting here. My initial instinct was bishop takes e4. And I think I'm going to stick with that. Pawn takes, also possible. But I, I do like the idea of having this bishop oppose this one on g2. So let's go with that. Now, my time is getting low here. This is an, in no increment game. So I'm going to have to stop, ta stop talking so much and speed up. <laughs> But we've already had a couple impactful decisions in the last few moves. All right, knight h4. Probably trade on g2 here. I think that's fine. Yeah, maybe trade g2 and then play um, queen c7. Take aim against this pawn, get my queen off the back rank. Watch for this square, the e4 square, to be occupied. I'd love to put a knight there. I may have to work up to that, though, because knight here runs into queen d4 again, so... I'm thinking maybe this f6 move can come into the picture. Knight e5 is another, another option here. I'm going to play f6. Note that this is not a blunder of a fork because I have queen takes g3 with check. So let's put a roadblock in the way of this bishop. Interesting position, though. I mean, I got to watch g5 as a pawn break. That would be like a violent pawn break that white might try. Don't see that working out in the short term, but I got to gotta keep an eye on it.
yeah, notice I'm putting pawns on the same color as white's remaining bishop here. We want to do that as opposed to the opposite, where the bishop would have greater scope if we put pawns on light squares or something. Got a few on light squares already, but the bishop's diagonal towards my king is being blunted. If I were white, I would definitely be considering where to deploy my queen here. There's several different squares possible. For the safeguarding of my own position, I may play rook f7 soon, because that just takes the sting out of any knight e6 in the future. If ever white can think about landing that, uh, then it won't be a fork, my queen and rook. Also, I like that it reinforces g7. Could be handy in some cases. Trying to draw up a mental blueprint if white plays something like queen e2, just indicating that they're going to castle queen side. Again, I like the breaks on the queen side, but this is the padlock pawn structure. If I push one of these pawns, white has the option of pushing past and closing it. So I do have to keep that in mind. Maybe I would push the a pawn. Wow, king f2. Interesting. All right. Yeah, so I'm still looking at that rook f7 move, maybe with knight e5 on the way. Just seems like a nice little square. Yeah, there's also this one. Ah, maybe this is the move now because queen d4 is less of a concern now. All right, so I can get that knight into that excellent square if I want. Maybe there's some value of keeping the knight trained on g4. But yeah, let's, let's play rook f7 first. See how white responds here. Again, need to start making some quick decisions. Bullet fins coming out here. <laughs> All right, let's play this one. White's just tucking their king away, so no queenside plan for white. That's pretty clear at this point. Now watch for me to try to attack these pawns. I think those are going to be my clearest targets. Not sure. Arguably, I should have ran the knight into e4 right away, but I'm not 100% sure how great that plan is, so I'm just postponing that for now. Okay, advances there. Um, let's play knight b6. Yeah, I like knight b6, trying to come into c4, because white just created a fresh weakness here. I'm eyeing up that square attacking the bishop and the pawn. And I can imagine, since I played rook e8, this knight leaving the e7 square and continuing to pressure the pawn on e3 with the help of the knight. Still making sure that something like g5 isn't going to hurt me. I'm taking with the f pawn in that instance. Again, helpful that the rook is guarding this pawn too, just in case... There's some sort of battery on g7. At this point, I feel I've laid a solid enough uh, framework for my pieces to start coming into the position. Okay, rook e1. Let's play knight c4, attack the bishop. Bishop d4, okay. And now I'm thinking about moving this knight. Might be time to move this. I do not want white playing e4. So I'm going to maneuver it, look to do this, and maybe get my knight all the way in there eventually. I don't really care about white playing knight g6. I don't think it does much there. So yeah, let's continue maneuvering this knight. Could also have played rook e7, but I feel better with this knight getting in the game. Once I install this knight here, that should be pretty annoying for white because they constantly have to watch g3, and uh, if this knight ever moves, that pawn could become incredibly weak. Again, f5, also a move that should be on my radar. I could maybe play it right here. White's attacking a5 a couple times. You know what? I think I'm just going to play a4, close down that side of the board before white gets it in their head to take. Now that I prevented this, I think it's a good moment to pause and do that. Kind of ties down White's rook to the pawn on a3.
you can see a lot of what I'm doing is giving myself options. You know, I, I like that I can play knight e4, but I also like that I can play f5. I love that my rook's already in a decent position. Maybe I can double rooks even. Got to watch knight g6 in that case, but I'm not committing to something yet when I know I have a solid position to work with and I've shut down a lot of white's overt threats. I think white is on the defensive now and I'm hoping to uh, reap the benefits of that scenario. Okay, pivots the knight. So is it going to c5? Now that white is doing that, I think this f5 move could be good. I also wonder about simply trying to attack here. That looks nice as well. So the knight might be driven back to f2. Yeah, let's probe with the queen, shall we? Let's go here. Attack this pawn. Could also go to d7. I'm just going to c8 just, just in case knight c5 ever comes. Probably a moot point, but... Yeah, now I think f5 is looking very nice for me. Let's do it. We're lined up right with that white king on this diagonal. I can draw a diagonal line. The only question is if white takes the pawn, which piece to recapture with? Ooh, both options look good. Pawn takes. Actually, all three options look good here. <laughs> Knight, rook, queen. Maybe slight preference just visually for the queen. Comes with check. Forks the king, king in the pawn. If g4, I can play uh, queen f3 check. Okay, white brings the knight back, but I think if I take on g4, knight takes g4, rook e4 ends it. So let's go ahead and capture. And white may realize now that they can't take. Yes, they do realize that. All right. Uh, let's bring the queen in. Really nice coordination going on here, folks. This is defended. Pawn on h5 is weak. We're still hindering the e4 break. This position looks completely winning, but let's continue playing good moves here. Yeah, white may, may get desperate here and start lashing out, something like e4. Maybe they'll play a king move. Yeah, anticipating that. Um, I'm thinking I'm probably going to give a check on f3. I think this is wise. Just see how white responds. If king h2, maybe I lift the rook and then go after the pawn on h5. Yep, white does play king h2. Rook f5 looks good. Let's do it. So my queen is real nice here. Attacks the rook on e2. The capture's coming here. If king g1, I don't have mate on h1, unfortunately, but nearly so. So many moves I could play there. Queen takes g3, knight e4. Probably knight e4 is the quickest way to end it at that point. Yeah, and here we're going to have a nice little checkmate pattern. The triangle mate. There we go. You can see here the triangle. The triangle and kill box mate are two mating patterns that often go together. You can drive the enemy down the board with your queen and rook. Uh, my opponent said, sorry, in the chat. <laughs> and then says, said, GG, LOL. <laughs> well, no, no reason to apologize. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Obviously, I got to say, my time management is not something I can recommend to you guys. It does take a lot of effort to explain the moves in a useful fashion when... Um, your opponent's moving quickly like that, especially at the outset. So that, that's a common issue I run into. You know, around about here, I wish I had, let's say, maybe three more minutes on my clock. Somewhere in the six to seven minute range at this point, I think would have been decent. Uh, in, in reality, better to use uh, increments when you play guys to avoid any crazy end of the game scenarios. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with how I played the later stages of the game. I will be curious what the engine thinks about the whole E4 decision. Again, the hippo setup that white is playing here, it's an interesting one. Basically, white's trying to control the pawn breaks. They're expanding a little bit on the king side, and they're trying to, trying to be flexible, trying to maybe bait black into overextending, perhaps playing a pawn move uh, prematurely in the center that allows the position to become locked up and enables white to attack on one side of the board or the other, usually the king side. So you can see, I tried to be flexible and keep my options open at every turn, right? 
gaining space over here. Feel free to put three, four, maybe even five pawns on the fourth or fifth rank. If you're the side with more space, you should definitely be occupying that extra rank of space compared to your opponents. But train your pawn breaks effectively. Try to create two points of contact like I did here. Because when you do that, you know, if this knight were back on d2 and I played e4, um, forgetting the fact that e4 might be covered, white can play d4 and lock it up if they wanted, <clears throat> right? So it's nice when you create two points of contact. I've talked about that concept for years on my channel. I think I coined that term, actually, even though <laughs> it's not a term that's really caught on or anything, but uh, it kind of encapsulates, encapsulates what's, what you want to look for here um, against these setups that rely on the position remaining closed. So I'll be curious if the engine does like E4. Remember, I was debating the F5 move at various times. Could play it here. Could play it here as well. So I'll be curious what the computer thinks about that. But yeah, after this, I feel like black has somewhat of an advantage. I don't think the trade of the light square bishops was that great for white. King F2, I'm also not a big fan of. I think the position is... Um, Easier to play for white if they if they do castle queenside. So something like queen e2, get ready, getting ready to castle long. I still had some attacking ideas in mind against that, but the king never felt truly safe on the king side. And with no feasible pawn break here, I think white's play kind of stalls out, honestly. Like, this is not a great structure. Having the pawns on e3, g3, g4. I've hindered g5. I've blocked the bishop. I'm being wary of night jumps. Um, I think long-term, black should have an edge. Okay, so let's take a peek at the analysis. All right, so 76.5 accuracy for my opponent, 89.7 for me. Turn off the feedback here. Yeah, so the Nimzo Larson, lots of ways you can play against this. Of course, a lot of people play E5. There's nothing wrong with that. I personally don't like to have that pawn under pressure if I can avoid it. But this line's perfectly playable. Feel free to look into the, to the theory if you want. But I've almost always played d5 in this position. And then this move, bishop g4. I just like that it hinders the e3 reply by white. Uh, it's a nice move to prevent. So just one of many, many setups. And then g3, yeah, interesting, going for the double fianchetto. I do think c6 makes a lot of sense there. Maybe I could play something like knight f6, uh, e6, c5. That probably is, is also fine. In fact, the more I think about that, it's probably justified because it's less likely white's going to like break open the queen side and hit me with a queen b3 move or something because that's just far from possible here. So yeah, maybe that's a little more ambitious than what I did. But I play c6. This, this has some resemblance to the last climbing the rating ladder game that I played, which uh, thank you to my opponent in that game, by the way, Schism. Schism, you're awesome because Schism actually showed up in the comments and wrote extensively about what they were thinking about in that game. And that also featured a fianchetto uh, of the kingside bishop. So go check that game out if you haven't already. So this time we have the double fianchetto. And knight d7, my opponent chased my bishop. It, it may feel a little weird to have the bishop floating out here, but uh, I'm trying to induce those pawns forward in the hopes of proving that it creates weaknesses in its wake. Yeah, so d3. So I have a feeling <clears throat> something like knight f3 is probably a little better to control the e5 square because then I may have to settle for the structure with e6 rather than pushing my pawn to e5. So all right, d3, I do get e5 in. g4, white pushes the bishop back, but at the cost of weakening some squares, right? So f4, h4, knight d2. Yeah, the engine's already calling for me to play h5. Interesting, yep. Probably should have considered that, but I was content to simply develop here. Bishop d6. Something like f4 would be kind of interesting now, because if I take, there's bishop takes g7. But uh, apparently even that is good for black, according to the computer. It likes my prospects here, even going down in exchange. Probably because the dark squares are so compromised for white. Monster bishop here. Queen h4 maybe on deck. So... I do believe it when it says that white has compensation. I could also simply play something like f6. I guess h5 is good here too. And if this, tuck the bishop back on h7. White's taking some liberties with their king safety by doing all this. So e3, this is like the pure hippo setup now. 
which the hippo setup can be used for white or black. It's more of like a system. Um, back in the day when engines were starting to become strong, a lot of human players experimented with these setups, including Gary Kasparov, against engines because they, they believed that the, the computer didn't understand how to handle the pawn breaks and um, was misevaluating these positions sometimes. But hopefully we're smarter than that now. Yeah, so I castle. Again, the computer is pretty, pretty adamant about h5 being a top move here. I do agree with that. It does front run the whole h4 plan by white. So yeah, I can see how that's strong. G5, castle, interesting. Then it's something like h4, f6, right. So even though I've castled kingside, it's quite possible that I will play that uh, f pawn forward. Like, yeah, my king's opening up a little bit, but I'm pretty safe on this diagonal towards my king. White's bishop is all the way over here. And if I can catch white underdeveloped, maybe I can attack that pawn on f2. You know, say something like this with knight g4 coming in. This starts to look juicy for black. So castles instead. h4, I played h6. Wasn't liking h5 as much. I just didn't want to give white any momentum on this wing. Yeah, knight g3 attacking this multiple times. You can imagine, like, if I take here, h5, bishop retreats, queen takes g4, I feel like I'm on the defensive a little bit relative to the game. So h6, white pushes my bishop back, knight g3. Yeah, and here I had my first major points of indecision. I sensed my position was decent here, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to play f5 or keep things flexible. And again, the computer kind of disagreeing with what I did and indicating that f5 is fine. But yeah, I just wasn't quite sure. Uh, I felt better ga getting some space over here in anticipation of white whisking their king away to that side of the board because having pushed over on the king side, I doubt white wants to castle king side anymore. But f5 is playable. Let's say a trade happens. Something like this. I'm starting to fight back over there and there may be some targets on this wing. Even queen e7, just bringing the queen out, maybe bishop a3 sometimes happens to trade off this bishop. Looks decent. But okay, a5, white plays a3. Yeah, and again, notice the pawns on the third rank for white. Stay inflexible. If I go a4, white would probably play b4, push past. Not that it's not a bad idea for me, but that's their strategy. So I played b5 here. Uh, White went ahead and played knight f3, and this is where I struck with e4. I think I had a decent little think at this point. Yeah, two minutes, 20% of my time in a 10-minute game. That's a lot of time, but I felt like this was a key moment because if I hesitate on this break, I may not get another moment to break with the f or the e pawns cleanly because I felt like knight h4 was coming. Right? Let's say I play queen c7. I don't know if this is much to be afraid of, but this can kind of signal a shift in the position. It at least controls the f5 square better for white. Looks like the computer still thinks this is fine for black. Some continuation like this. Interesting. But I'm happy that I, I kind of recognize that this was a moment where maybe one of the, the pawn breaks would occur. So, and this is, this is thematic. Two points of contact, guys. Useful if you're trying to open the position and exploit a lead in development, which I do have here. If white had played queen e2, keeping things real flexible, looking to castle, again, this would have been interesting. I mentioned that scenario. I was really unsure. I might go for the a4 move. I might play queen c7, just wait a little bit more. Let's say white castles here, maybe then a4. And if white insists on keeping this closed, well, now we charge forward c5, initiating contact here. Yeah, actually, this looks amazing for me, doesn't it? My queen is lined up with the white king. Knight takes d3 as the threat. This is already minus five, according to the computer. So that's just an example of where the groundwork I've laid on the queen side could prove handy if I get a pawn break in over there when, when white commits their king. So b5. Yeah, the engine's suggesting white maybe consider g5, which is interesting. So if I take, what, h6 or something? h6, I can play g6. Bishop's kind of buried, but a pawn's a pawn. Queen g4, yeah, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an intriguing approach, sacrificing a pawn just purely to open the king side. White may not get it back, 
Or if they do, they might um, even run into some tactics like this. That is interesting, though. Hmm. Okay, so knight f3. I played this e4 move. Two points of contact again. Uh, oh, interesting that it does say knight takes e4. I just assumed that move wouldn't work at all. Take, d takes? What's the point here? Sacrifice the piece for two pawns? That can't possibly be good, right? I know there's an attack here. Yeah, that looks like an engine line. <laughs> it's, it's saying push g5 next, but I don't see too, too many humans doing this. I don't think this looks too appealing, but interesting. So instead, d takes e4. Uh, and then I insert the trade on g3. This move is key. Yeah, nothing else really makes the cut here. I need to get rid of one of the defenders of e4. And I also don't want my bishop to be hanging on d6 in some cases. So takes. I took with the bishop here. Queen c7 also possible. Hitting g3. But bishop takes looks pretty good. Huh. Top move here. Castles kingside. Just castle kingside. And a bit of an advantage for black. Yeah, I'd say clear advantage. Could play kind of like the game. I think white's going to have trouble with these pawns, but that is interesting. White played knight h4. I went ahead and traded. Looks fine. Queen c7, gain a tempo on the pawn. And then f6. I really like this f6 move, guys. Again, apologies to Ben Feingold, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, blocking the bishop. Two pawns connected on this powerful diagonal for the dark square bishop. Remember, knight e6. Forking the queen and the rook. Not a concern because we take on g3 with check and then I can move the rook or possibly do something else on the next move. So that that really set me up well. Also hindered the g5 move. And I was kind of criti critical of king f2 afterwards. Yeah, I don't know. It still feels kind of loose to me, but honestly, the position doesn't look great for white. Still suggesting castles or maybe queen d4. Queen d4, I was thinking about moves like knight e5. Threatening here and here. Still got to watch 96, but I like what I'm working with there. Yeah, and again, keeping options open. Maybe I could play knight c5 right away here. Try to come into e4, but I like this rook f7 move. Just to add some further defense to some key points. Rook e8, same thing. I know my rook's going to be handy. I think this was probably a bad idea for white, but I don't have too many better options or, or uh, suggestions. And maybe rookie one. I just feel strategically with this backward pawn and the G pawn, that's not going to move. This is very difficult for white. Hmm. Okay. Knight C8 is given. Knight C8 is a nice little maneuver. Yeah. Unveils the attack on E3. This, this looks pretty good though, too. I jump in, attack the bishop, hit the pawn. Knight comes back here. White had a few other options. Bishop c3, maybe trying to probe on uh, a5. I'd like to keep the queen side kind of closed, so I wasn't in a hurry to take this pawn. If white took here, I could always take with my king, by, my queen, by the way, and this pawn is backwards on a3. Yeah, and roundabout here, I think this is getting into strategically lost territory for white. Too many weaknesses, and my pieces are coming to life. Kept it closed there, a4, just no b takes a5 to worry about. I'm not feeling rushed on the board at all now. It's just the clock, just the clock situation. Punch through with f5, also knight e4 is good. Yeah, I think this is just too much at this point. Again, if knight takes on g4, then rook e4 is one move that decides. Why well, can't defend the knight? Yeah, the rest was just cleaning up here many ways to win this so where exactly did white lose this game well i think this whole plan probably not the best for white like um knight f3 in particular maybe the position is still playable albeit slightly worse for white round about here that g5 suggestion at various times by the engine is interesting um i'm not going to claim that after knight f3 e4 white is losing but i do think the resulting position is tough for white if they don't get a break or some sort of counterplay immediately because you saw once i got my grip on the position white had no play so probably in actuality this whole setup's a little dubious and hopefully this is helpful for those of you who face the hippo and allowing the e4 break 
was not in White's best interest, and White has to play very accurately after this to hold. Maybe Castle's a you know, slightly better way to coordinate, but I think White is suffering nonetheless. Okay, I'm going to wrap this analysis up here. I think I hit the, the salient points. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you have trouble against these hippo-type setups. Again, white or black can do this. It's really um, a flexible setup. But it probably is something that can be punished. But feel free to be patient. Set up multiple pawns in the center. I mean, even from the jump, had this gone down in a slightly different way, I might have even played my pawn up to f5 or to c5. Three, four pawns up there. And try to concentrate your effort on finding a pawn break. A pawn move where you're attacking ideally two points and your opponent has no choice but to open it, um, open it up, allow the position to become open. If you do that, you can catch them a little flat-footed and uh, capitalize often on your lead and development in your space. All right, thanks to my opponent for the game. Hope you're all doing well and let me know if you have any questions. All right, guys.